So it's the question and answer period. And uh, then we're going to have a break and come back with Jim Laurie as our next speaker. Um, we only have this mic in the hall, but um, they're telling me that if you speak up, the, your question will be heard. If you're soft-spoken or if you'd just like to come up and use the mic, you're welcome to. But are there questions in the audience for either Walter and or Michael? Yes. Right, look, um, yeah, very important. Yeah. As we've talked about, Michael's talked about, we're evaporating and transpiring water that's taking heat up into the atmosphere. But it's really what happens to that water once it gets to the atmosphere, that's the critical issue, right? And at the moment, a lot of that water is forming in haze micro droplets because we've increased the amount of aerosols that are in the atmosphere. We've increased aerosols about 5 billion tonnes of dust and carbon particulates and aerosols up there. And these create micro droplets and they're the humid hazes, pollutant hazes, and we've got all the data in India, for example, a 30% decrease in the Asian monsoon because of these pollutant humid hazes. And so they're aridifying, but they're also warming because that's what's causing the global dimming, all documented. 15 to 20 percent of the incident solar radiation is now absorbed by these hazes. So they're, in a sense, a warming, aridifying, negative effect. Now, the issue is how do we get those hazes out of the air and back down as rain to stop the warming, but also to give us that critical life empowering rain. And nature does it three ways. It's either ice crystals, salts, or particular very hygroscopic bacteria. And these are the precipitation nuclei. And so when Michael too talks about the water cycle, look, rain doesn't occur naturally, automatically, physically. Rain only occurs when it is nucleated by these precipitation nuclei. Uh, we talked yesterday, up to 50,000 parts <coughs> per million of water is flowing around. We have aerial rivers of water flowing around the air all the time. And there's 10 times more water in that air than we have surface river run. But it's whether we can nucleate that humid air, convert it from those warming hazes into high albedo clouds and then rainfall which is governed by these precipitation nuclei. Um, and of course, the thing that we influence most in that, not so much the ice crystal, but those bacterial precipitation nuclei, and they're produced by forests. But we can go into the physics and biochemistry of that mm -hmm. in a lot more detail. It's a bigger subject. Yes. OK, in the back. Peter? You mentioned uh, the great reservoir of carbon in the ocean. Yes. And how that would act to re-equilibrate as we try to pull carbon out yes. of the atmosphere. Yes. Could you say just a little bit more about that? And what that well, okay. Um, right. So in terms of carbon sinks, of course, um, it's beyond corals and chalk and limestone, that ocean carbon sink is the largest global sink of carbon. And yes, it re-equilibrates. And Hansen, Sato, you know, it's all published. Basically, as we release carbon, a significant amount, up to 70%, initially is absorbed by the oceans, and then it re-equilibrates over 70 to 100 years to about a third or 40% of the carbon stays in. But it's a buffer. You know, it's in a sense the, the lag, the buffer, and obviously the same thing goes in reverse. As we draw down more carbon from the air to try and balance the 10 billion tonnes that we're in a sense putting in there now, the oceans will re-equilibrate some of that carbon that's absorbed over the last 250 years back into the air. So the answer is just even drawing down carbon can't save us in terms of this dangerous climate extremes that Joachim Schellenhuber warned us about. So really it is this need to actively cool. And so the implication is then that we actively 
carbon levels themselves are not as critical as has been thought? Uh, basically, if we can cool that three watts per square meter, yes, then we have got more time. We still have to draw down that carbon because we need it for our sponge. You see, we, if we don't have the sponge, we don't have water, we're cactus. But if Fair we... Enough. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. Um, the question is for Michael. Yesterday you talked about the new water deal and how you, you know, created jobs and you're also doing things to restore the small water cycle. I was wondering if you could describe what you guys were doing. About creating employment. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, I, I think we will be speaking after a Jane presentation about global action plan for restoring of okay. small water cycle and climate. Just now we are spoke to only about this principle of new water paradigm, how, it, how it's working about for inspiration for that. On the aisle. oxidizing carbon from our biosystem by land clearing, by desertification for the last 10,000 years. That's called civilization, right? So that's what we've been doing. And basically, a, a CO2 started going up about 1750 AD, right? We've really exponentially only increased fossil fuel use since the Second World War in a big exponential. So CO2 has been going up for 200 years, before that mass carbon release from burning fossil fuel. Of course we've got to stop, slow down burning fossil fuel, no question. Of course at the moment we've got a 10 billion tonnes carbon per annum deficit in that balance that Keeling showed us. Okay, so of course we've got to draw that down. But we're really saying that, what we're saying is that yeah, carbon is perhaps, or CO2 is more a symptom of our oxidation of carbon from the landscape plus fossil fuels. Of course we've got to mop up the blood on the floor, but we've really got to actually look at the wound. And actually 95% of the Earth's heat dynamics is driven by these 10 hydrological processes that we talked about. We didn't actually get to the last two. 4% of the world's heat dynamics is driven by the CO2 component of the natural greenhouse effect. So really it's uh, empowering us, we've got to step out of that <coughs> CO2 space alone to say we now have to have a much more capable, safe, natural means to cool the climate. And yes, we can do that through these hydrological processes. But carbon becomes a tool in that because it's drawing down that carbon into the sponge. So it's really our empowering resource, our tool to rebuild the hydrology. Michael's got something to add. Yeah, yeah and, and, and I, I will uh, add some, uh, another comment about, because yeah. Walter say about its uh, uh, water is in atmosphere is greenhouse effect. And if we, we are dry up of lands, we are decreasing producing of greenhouse H2O to atmosphere. It is many times more like increasing by, by uh, decreasing of sequestration of uh, uh, carbon in ecosystem and producing of from industry. It's many times more is decreasing of H2O carbon uh, greenhouse uh, effect in atmosphere like is producing of CO2 to atmosphere from uh, 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 desequestration of uh, carbon in ecosystem and producing from industry. More questions? Yes, Sudhir?
At, if you are looking at this picture about uh, uh, Cyprus island, and it is how is for more uh, uh, behavior of clouds around uh, this heat island because in, in special in in uh, 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 summer, which is very heat, it is produce a lot of sensible to atmosphere and to block of uh, flowing clouds to inside of territory on the island. The same is everywhere. In, uh, which was uh, changed dramatically change of ecosystem on the islands uh, here in the uh, Caribbean uh, space or San Helen and then and other small islands. This is very important it's because it's uh, yesterday I spoke that it's uh, f f in one day in from Slovakia in its summer period was produced uh, uh, more than 100 terawatt hours of energy from heat from uh, dry ecosystem. It's uh, time, a uh, uh, thousand times more like produ production of electricity power station in Slovakia. It is the same everywhere because, and Walter say above is this relationship between between a solar energy and uh, ultraviolet radiation, and it's we, we know that it's a one cubic meter consumption of the vapor, 700 kilowatt hours of energy. It is massive, enormous everywhere on the globe about uh, 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 dry lands, which is everywhere, because we know that it's uh, 51 million square kilometer around the globe is dry land. Look, uh, very quickly on that island and uh, Ferdinand Columbus's analysis. The Portuguese found Madeira in 1410. It was a rainforest with mahogany trees and that's how they built their caravels to do all their explorations. There's no mahogany, never has been in Portugal. And they cut those trees with water-powered sawmills and they floated two-metre diameter logs down the rivers to cut them up. Once they'd cut all the rainforest, no more rain. If you go to Madeira now, there are no rivers. OK, it's basically a semi-arid, like the Canary Islands, a semi-arid shrubland. So there's more going on there. I mean, certainly there's a heat island effect, but it also comes to the whole question of rainfall nucleation because you've got those humid air flows from the Atlantic. They haven't changed. It's a question of is Madeira nucleating the rain that it did previously or are those humid air flows going past? And you've got exactly the same question in the Sierra Nevada if you want to have a future for California. Okay, that we're going to wrap it up there. Let, let's, uh, let's have a brief break, get to know each other some more, and we'll be back shortly. 10.30.